So welcome to another very interesting lesson and this is the fifth lesson in which what we learn is wave speed on a straight string or we'll derive the velocity of wave in a straight string. So we've established that the speed of a wave is related to the waves, wavelength and frequency. But if you think a little deeper, what you'll find is that eventually it is set by the properties of the medium in which the wave is propagating. So you'll never find a thread between your hands vibrate the same way as a rubber band if you've pulled both to the same magnitude of force and plugged them pretty much the same way. We've also learned that waves are a result of vibrations of the medium in which they are traveling. A wave traveling through a medium such as wood, water, iron or a straight string must cause a particle of that medium to oxalate as it moves across. And well, if there is vibration, there has to be kinetic energy, which therefore would require mass because there can be no kinetic energy without mass. So mass has to play a role in determining how the wave would look like. Well, we also know from the earlier lesson that this kinetic energy is not constant. It fluctuates between some minima and a maxima and the change in kinetic energy manifests itself as potential energy in the string which therefore means elasticity of the string also is a predictor of the way the wave will behave and indeed mass and elasticity both determine how fast a wave will travel and that's what we're going to see in this derivation that follows. So there are several ways of finding the magnitude of this dependency on uh, mass and elasticity. It could be done through dimensional analysis using Newton's second law of motion or using impulse momentum method. Well, I felt that Newton's second law uh, of motion is the most convenient way of deriving the velocity of the wave in a straight string. So let's go ahead and employ this method to find velocity, which is a function of mass and elasticity of the string. So consider a single symmetrical pulse moving with a velocity V along a string. So let us zoom into a small string element of length delta L. And well, this is part of the pulse that is an arc of a circle of radius R. So let us say this is the center of the circle. The length of the radius is R. So let's go ahead and label this as radius r and this arc makes an angle to theta with the center of the circle so we can say that this angle is 2 theta and if we draw a line right through the center well we can say that each of this angle is angle theta and this is also theta so that the total angle subtended by delta L is 2 theta at the center. Well, you can observe that this arc, this small arc of length delta L is part of the circle which has a radius R and not the pulse itself. So let's also label that the velocity of this wave is V. Now, the force that pulls the string would have a magnitude equal to the tension T in the string. Let's assume the tension is denoted by T in the string and pulls tangentially on this element on each side. So let's go ahead and show the vector representation of this tension T or the force which pulls the string in both directions. And this tension T in the string pulls tangentially on this element on each side. So what you'll observe is that the horizontal component of these forces nullify each other. So the horizontal component of this tension T nullifies with the horizontal component of this tension T on this side, which is acting in this direction. But the vertical component add up to form a restoring force directed towards the center. Well, you might say that it is not really directing towards the center, but the thing is that the angle we've taken looks too large. If this angle is small enough, if it converges to a very small value, what you'll find is that the vertical component will also start converging towards the center of the circle. So we can say that the total force 
which is acting towards the center on this string of length delta L is nothing but F is equal to 2 times T sine theta because we know that T sine theta is the magnitude of vertical component on account of this T and there's another T sine theta on account of this T and both put together are in the downward direction towards the center and therefore the total force is 2T sine theta. Well, if you assume that theta is very small, we can say that F is equal to 2T theta where theta is in radians. So let's go ahead and make a note of this that theta is in radians. Well, we also know that the length of the arc of a circle is equal to the product of the radius of the circle and the angle subtended at the center measured in radians. So we can say that delta L is equal to R times 2 theta because the angle subtended at the center is 2 theta. In that case, we can say, well, F is equal to T times delta L upon R because you can see that 2 theta is nothing but delta L upon R and that's what we have substituted for 2 theta over here. Now, let us assume that the linear density of this string is mu or the mass per unit length is mu and if the mass of this small string, this small section delta L is delta M, then we can say that the linear density is nothing but delta M upon delta L. So this could be in grams per centimeter or kilograms per meter or whatever the relevant units are. In which case we can say that, well, delta M is equal to mu times delta L. Now we can also see that the string element delta L is moving in an arc of a circle and therefore it should experience a centripetal acceleration V square upon R towards the center. So we can write that the centripetal acceleration on the string element of length delta L is equal to V square upon R. And if you go ahead and use Newton's second law of motion which says that force on a mass is equal to the product of its mass into its acceleration and acceleration is induced by that force. And if you use this equation and substitute the values of F which we've established over here. So let's go ahead and put F as T delta L upon R and put the value of mass which is delta M over here as mu delta L and the value of acceleration as V square upon R. What we can see is we get this equation where a lot of variables are cancelling, R cancels, delta L cancels and eventually what we get is V is equal to under root of T upon mu. So a couple of very interesting observations you can make from this equation are that one, the velocity of the string depends on linear density and tension in the string and has no dependence on the frequency of the wave. You can clearly see that frequency does not appear in this expression. Uh, number two, the velocity of any string made of same material under similar tension will have the same velocity. Uh, the third observation is that the frequency of the wave is actually fixed by the source creating the waves. Well, it could be you if you are shaking the string or any mechanical device used to create the wave. Another conclusion can be that wavelength lambda is therefore fixed as V upon F. So another interesting way of uh, interpreting this equation is that velocity of a wave is equal to under root of restoring force returning the system to equilibrium divided by inertia resisting the return to equilibrium. So here tension T in the string provides a restoring force and brings the string back to the equilibrium position so you can see it's getting pulled towards the center while the mass of the string or the linear mass density mu provides the inertia that resists the string from returning to equilibrium. So you can see the interplay of two variables that is tension T in the string and mu which is the linear density of the string 
results in an expression for velocity of a mechanical wave. So if you like this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up and please do not forget to subscribe to this channel for many more interesting videos.